Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so, last year I was having some, um, some personal questions and professional interrogations. I, w I was discussing them with, uh, with Martin, and we ended up having a discussion about what can you do when you've sort of w been working around the field of interactive journalism for a few years, and you're looking, for, you're looking for something next. You wonder how you can evolve professionally and a bit personally as well. And there's several routes. You know, you can go into editing, you can go down to management, uh, leave journalism altogether, maybe try to go reporting full-time, which would mean leaving some of, the, some of your skills behind. Um, and what struck us was the lack of hierarchical, sort of clear, established paths like you would have for, let's say, more traditional reporters um, no grades like in the, in the public service uh, system, for example. And we wondered, maybe that field, interactive journalism, is still a bit special, maybe still a bit odd, but is that quite true? We're not sure. Um, and maybe the seniority, vanity titles you can get aren't quite, aren't quite enough. But the, the thing is, it's still a big issue. This is a screenshot from the, the, Newsnet, the Newsnet survey from last year. Was it in the fall, something like this? And that identifies the lack of, promotion, lack of promotion and general career opportunities as the main reason why news nerds leave the field, which is rather dramatic. Sorry, I leave specific jobs. Um, and so we, go, we all got together, um, and we're gonna do this panel today. We're gonna explore some of these issues, uh, try to give some context, and then hopefully we'll have plenty of time at the end to open the room um, for question. Um, the first thing we wanted to do, I started to be loud. <laughs> you, should, you should say who you are. Oh, this is really loud now. Yeah. So my name is Basil, I work at the Times and the Sunday Times, uh, and I teach the Advanced Data and Coding module for the AMA of, in Interactive Journalism at City University. And with us, we've got Nikki from uh, George Washington University and soon the University of Illinois College of Media. Uh, Martin Stubber, the head of interactive news at the Financial Times. And Lisa from Datawapper. And I wanted just to start things off with Uniki, because really I think we need to signpost a few things, give some vocabulary context. What's a news nerd? Is there something special about these teams? Yeah, and for yeah. sure. So let's flip ahead to that. So you can never resist a chance to promote your book. Um, but the reason that Basil uh, asked me to be part of this is I actually wrote a book on news nerds, as it were. There's terrible. OK. Hello? Yeah? Yes? Better? Yes? OK. Uh, so I actually wrote a book on data journalists, which I called interactive journalists, just for a very specific reason, because Data journalism, to me, connotes this old school uh, computer-assisted reporting, whereas we're in a whole new era where a lot of data journalism is interactive, right? It's about the web. It's about mobile. It's about engaging. And so I think there's a, a distinction. Point being, I wrote a book in which I think I talked to 183 different people uh, who were in these sorts of positions, visited 14 different news organizations. And so at this point, I feel like I can say something about my research subjects before you. Um, so to give you a sense of, of, right, the big question is who are these people, right? How do you categorize your path of entry into the profession? Um, how do you make a case for your expertise? And part of that is knowing who you are and having a typology to describe what you do, right? So if you could flip ahead, right? So the way uh, 2009, the Knight, Journal Knight put together the slide to try to talk about its vision of what, what journalism in the, the computational and data age might look like. And this was in, uh, so they made this, this, inner, this graphic um, of basically the life of Brian Boyer, who was at NPR last. Uh, started as a programmer working for financial investments, um, then took advantage of a free scholarship um, to go to Northwestern University and learn journalism, right? And so 
he represented the perfect melding of this vision of what the hacker journalist would be, right? So initially imagine as a technologist getting some journalism together and then working in the newsroom. I think that there are some really interesting value judgments associated with the way that this slide was conceptualized and the beginning of the field was really talked about. All right, so first note, like I want to note out that this is a dude programmer, right, like a man, and then it ends with the man beard, uh, the programmer beard being indicative of male masculinity and technology. But, right, so you've got the cool coder who's like breaking things and writing in code, uh, chill clothes, right? Then you've got the nerdy reporter uh, who's the big picture thinker, um, the storyteller, the wordsmith, the contrarian, um, and dorky, right, wearing the v-neck sweater. And if you mush them together, somehow you get uh, sneakers, and um, a flannel shirt and a beard, right? But this is the vision of sort of when we started talking about the modern incarnation of data journalism, of computational journalism, what would it look like? And it would be a techie invading the news, right? And if you know, and Martin will talk a lot about this, but if you'll note, right, all of these, these terms that have to do with telling a story, with being a craftsman of journalism, are in the journalist. The technologist is, is the engineer with the process and problems. And that already presents a juxtaposition that's a problem, right? Because it's, it's a typology that really sees two very different skill sets. And maybe from the outset, that is a problem. You could. But the truth is there's some, some truth to this. And so in order to make a case for the value proposition of where a news nerd starts and where a news nerd ends, where somebody who has these computational skills comes to a newsroom, it's important to at least be able to define who you are. And so as I was doing this research, it became pretty clear to me that there were sort of three ways to think about what Basil is calling a news nerd, right? So there are hacker journalists, and on that slide, that was the example of the hacker journalist, somebody who came from outside the newsroom, somebody who had the ethos of somebody who had been engaged in programming, right? The, the sort of lean startup model, a belief in openness and transparency, um, the willingness to break things and put out prototypes that weren't quite good yet, right? All of these sort of disrupt things that we associate with disruptive technology, but also somebody who maybe didn't have the editorial acumen when it comes to telling what a story is, right? So this was a programmer invading journalism with all sorts of cool new skills, but not necessarily the skills of a journalist. So that's one model, right? The programmer coming into news. And then I, I sort of realized that there was another group, programmer journalists. Okay, what do I mean by that? Because I just told you the hacker journalists were programmers. Um, but what I mean by that are people who are journalists, primarily, who have taught themselves how to become programmers, right? So these are people who begin from the perspective of editorial and then have realized this is a nifty and important skill set, either to answer the questions they have journalistically, to remain marketable, right, at a time when this is a growing field among one of the few fields in journalism that is, right? Uh, or because they wanted to be able to manipulate data better than any of the existing pre-built ways of manipulating data was presented to them, right? So these are journalists who taught themselves how to program. That's a different orientation when you're coming to, to programming from the perspective of being a journalist first. And then there are just sort of data journalists. And this is where it gets confusing, um, particularly in Europe, because data journalism is often meant to describe things like everything, right? Everything that is like computational, interactive, and not a video or like a photo slide gallery is data journalism, right? That is an overly broad, overly inclusive, sort of meaningless term, right? Because A, Data journalism has been happening since, you know, the 1800s with tables, right? Um, but also because the term doesn't have any specificity as to what it is many people actually do. Only some people work with data, right? And so 
my understanding of a data journalist was somebody who actually wasn't re maybe, maybe not be creating something interactive, maybe with pre-built tools, maybe they knew how to program, but to be a data journalist, that's not a prerequisite. It's not knowing code. Being a data journalist means you actually understand data, and that is your primary focus is understanding and manipulating data, right? And so that's been around for a long time, and I think it's important to have that specificity because programmer journalists may not be people who can look at a congressional database and understand why every single FCC contribution, every election contribution matters, right? A data journalist can. And so I wanted to sort of present these as overarching ways to think about pathways into, into this field. Um, and I'll just talk about one or two more things, right? I've alluded to the fact that data journalism doesn't mean anything. Um, and so that's why I want us to push to think about like what are we actually talking about as new? And for me, it's the interactivity. So I've been pushing this idea of interactive journalism in part because I feel like what, what people are doing now are making data and storytelling interactive, right? It's about using code as an application on top of an existing CMS to give users the chance to manipulate it, right? That's what's fundamentally different. Otherwise, you're just talking about a flat graphic that is really no different online than it is in print form, right? Or as a flat, inoperable form. So I think that if we're going to talk about this as new, what's new is the ability to code right, or to create visuals um, or storytelling through code. You don't necessarily need to know how, but that for me is the difference. Um, uh, I realized I had on that slide, see Basil like made the slides pretty. Uh, but the other question is, right, um, as we start to see the need for these kinds of computational skills in editorial or in journalism beyond editorial, we also need to start to think of the space of what we begin to call people in newsrooms who are working in product development or maybe data science who are working on the business side of news, right? Who are not creating editorial products because there's a real need for those people. And you can argue that the Washington Post's sustainability advantage is that its engineering team and its product team are people <coughs> who also would want to and be able to work at Amazon, right? So what do we call those people and who are those people and is that a pathway we need to think about? Um, as, a, as a university educator in the States, um, it's a little bit different in our educational system, but all and throughout, uh, especially at the undergraduate level, when you're trying to give students a liberal arts curriculum and a journalism degree, there's very little time to teach data journalism. Not to mention the fact that there's a real self-selection. So most people who want to go into journalism school, right, or be a journalist, don't want to be data journalists. So we actually have trouble filling our classes um, into sort of a standard journalism school with a liberal arts foundation because people don't actually want to do data journalism. So if they end up taking it, it ends up being sort of one of the last courses of their program um, just as something so they can say they've done it. So I think that the pipeline, the formal pipeline is, is really weak and difficult. Um, and finally, I think it's also worth posing the question about who gets to be a data journalist. Um, so this is a 2009 uh, shot from New York, New York Magazine uh, sort of discovering that the interactive team at the New York Times existed. And what's funny about this is like pretty much nobody in this picture still works at the New York Times. So you've got Drew uh, Devagal, Aaron Pilhofer, Gabe Dance. Um, right, so, so these are sort of people who have come to be luminaries. Um, but they're all men, right? The nice thing is that this is really changing. Um, and you can look at the NICAR speaker representation and it's almost at parity. Um, what I didn't do a dig into was how much of that parity are hard coding positions versus sort of more product management or strategic thinking positions, which I think you'd find a worse gender breakdown. So. The question I have is as we start to think about the development of 
the field of news nerds, it's great that more women are starting to do this and they're finding that, that this is indeed a safe place to be a programmer. My worry though is that when you create the safe programming space, women end up choosing working in newsrooms instead of working in Silicon Valley, where I would argue that parity is more needed. So as a whole, right, from me, clear definitions, clear pathways for entry, and understanding who you are is probably the most important thing before you can make a case for your advancement. Were there, were there things about um, interactive journalism being a sort of subculture within the large journalism culture? Um, I mean, I think, let's, let's get to that after everybody sort of does their bit. But yeah, I mean, I think what, what we're seeing is the rise of a new sub-profession, like photographers, right? Until the 1940s, right, there weren't really professionalized photographers. And so photographers, really, the first time they were ever really to, able to make a dent was when they had portable enough cameras to, like, take into the battlefield and then send back quickly, right? That's, that's World War II, and they were viewed as very threatening um, to, to journalism as a whole, these, these photojournalists that could capture a story without context, right? And so if you look at the development of journalism over time, each time there's a new technological innovation, a new sort of subfield pops up and has to normalize itself into the field. The fact that we're having this conversation here at this conference suggests that there's been some institutionalization of interactive journalism or data journalism. Okay. Yeah. Um, I hope we come back to that actually. Yeah. So, <laughs> the subcultures aspect. You don't want to have an academic start talking history. So. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I, want to I want to send it to Lisa because now what we've got some elements about what is, what is the field, what are the different uh, subgroups that are in there and the different kind of people we can have within newsroom but also outside newsroom I was thinking startups and um, some people in government digital services right. uh, as well. Um, Lisa you've written very nice things about the different frustrations that are in this field and also that, that reason I mean obviously obviously you're here and then you also broke it down into different kinds of people hardcore on each side, but there's, there's a group in the middle which seems to be torn apart, so you have to tell us a bit. <laughs> sure, okay, so Basil invited me to this panel because of the one blog post I wrote half a year ago that was called a frustrating thing about um, creating data within newsrooms, and that kind of marked the end of working in newsrooms for me, actually, because it also marked the beginning of working for a charting tool for for journalists, which is called Data Wrapper. Um, so in this blog post, I had this chart, this visualization, um, and you can see people on the nexus, uh, on the left side, like all the wet people, um, are like people would identify as data viz experts, or as developers, or like news nerds. I'm not, I'm not so much into definitions as Nikki is. Um, and all the green people are the journalists, or reporters, um, or editors. Um, but not every data viz expert is creating data visualization like 100% um, of their day. So um, that's what you can see on this axis. You have um, people who actually do get into writing, although they started in the newsroom um, as like the data visualization person. And you also have journalists who learn how to code. So these are the queen people there. Um, so what's the frustration? <laughs> uh, well, I would, um, the frustration for me is the dynamic between these two teams as I experienced them while working for newsrooms in the last three years. Um, if you want to put it nicely, you would call it frustration or you would call it a question um, that I'm asking myself, like how do these two kinds of people collaborate? <laughs> if you want to ask it a bit harshly, you can say, okay, what's the power dynamic um, who controls who, like who serves whom, um, basically. Um, so it all starts like that. <laughs> the journalists are there to write, so they go to the database experts and um, say, here are four numbers, can you make us a bar chart? I want to publish that in five minutes. Um, and the database experts are like, yeah, okay, <laughs> well, what is your data? Can I see your source? That is actually makes sense. Um, 
maybe let's do a line chart instead, maybe let's not do a chart at all, it doesn't make any sense. Um, so they consult the journalists on this matter, but they are also kind of frustrated um, to do these simple bar charts because that means that they don't have time for the big stuff they actually want to do. Um, the big stuff is kind of that, like super fancy on the edge visualizations that move and stuff. Um, because I mean, these are like coders, these are developers, they want to do stuff that's at the edge of what's technologically possible. Um, and the journalists love that stuff too. It's like, ooh, it gets lots of clicks on social media and stuff. Um, but often they also just want to do a simple bar chart. Um, and I mean, they, they can do that too. They can open Excel and um, can proudly show off their Excel skills and do a screenshot of that, but then um, yeah, then the database experts will come and be like, whoa, what did you do? It's not responsive, it's not our brand colors, it's not our brand fonts, it doesn't make any sense, it's ugly as heck. And so they're like, so the journalists are like, okay, sh sure, you can do all our crafts. Um, you are our service desk now, <laughs> that's cool. And the database experts, of, of course, are not very happy with that because they want to do the big stuff, and then they think, okay, let's build a tool maybe so that the journalists can make these simple bar charts, but then they need the resources and the time to build this tool. Um, so it's not optimal and it's like, yeah, it really creates a dynamic where the journalists just go to the developers and the graphics people and ask for charts. And then of course that raises the questions, like how do these database experts get up then? How do they ever get in a position where they actually will not just make decisions about their own team and will become leaders of their own team, but also might be in a position one day where they lead and make decisions about the journalists. Um, <laughs> Martin, I think about that, you know, that dynamic between the database experts and the journalists, as Lisa called them, I think, would you say at the Financial Times or elsewhere, do the data folks, news nerds have a different status where somebody mentioned service desk, is that something you would? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think the, the dynamic of the subcultural groups within newsrooms um, being treated as a service is a, is a thing that comes up again and again. Um, historically, obviously, we talked about photographers. We've, um, graphics teams have long had this fight to establish autonomy, which some of them have now succeeded in achieving. And uh, of course, especially in European newsrooms, a lot of data teams, including my own, really evolved out of the graphics function. And so um, we're really continuing a, a, an attempt to, to be recognized as journalists that has, has been going on for several decades now. Um, so maybe I can go through some of um, what I've talked about with, with members of my team and with, uh, with Basil and, and other people. Um, I was at the NICAR conference there, uh, last month and um, there, was a lot of, there was a lot of discussion about this point, about what, are the, what, are the, what is the status, what is the power of um, people who are in these categories of journalists um, and as someone who works with all three types and people all along this spectrum of from writer to visualizer, um, I, I recognize the, 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 the tensions that exist there. So you just move on to the next thing, another one. Um, so I, I look back at wh where did I start seeing this a lot and actually um, it occurred to me that one of the, one, this, this, this very famous document from now four years ago, uh, the New York Times started uh, has a, uh, looked at their newsroom practices and found a, a really classic example of this, of how their digital talent was being sort of mismanaged. And um, in one little paragraph that I want to go through, um, it, it really highlights some of the problems that um, people along this spectrum really face, right? So they feel their expertise isn't being put to good use. Um, they don't, they have few growth opportunities, They're, they don't, don't have, um, and they don't think their bosses really understand their skills. I think a lot of, a lot of senior editors don't understand the range of skills involved in teams like this. Um, I think there is, there is some truth to the idea that there are um, few opportunities beyond perhaps leading a team like this, right? There, there's um, little, little opportunity to manage teams that are outside the specialism. Right, because they're coming from a position of being the subculture that is um, inside a, a dominant verbal culture. Um, and as a result, as their expertise increases, they feel it's not being used optimally. Um, uh, and as a result, news organizations 
will try to do things like shoehorn people with these specialist skills into the traditional career paths that have always existed. So uh, the traditional reporting career path might go something like a trainee gets hired early on in their career, um, will get general assignments, will, as they are increasingly trusted by editors, they will become more autonomous, they will become correspondents of some sort, they will move around to uh, more prestigious beats, um, they will become correspondents, they will lead a bureau somewhere perhaps, all the while they might be moving among publications to bigger, more prestigious jobs. Um, but, but there is this sort of um, rotation around jobs, this sort of upward spiral of status and even pay that comes with a sort of well-established process for developing a career in, in, within one news organization and across the industry as a whole. Um, but often those career paths are not really attractive to the people we're talking about. Um, because this is what it results in. It results in people being put in positions that, they are n that aren't really designed to take advantage of their skills. Now, mind you, this one paragraph kind of sums up the entire problem, and it was written four years ago, and we're still talking about it today. So, um, if you move on to the next thing, um, that's where we get to this. This was, this was last October, the chart that we started with. These are exactly the things that we were talking about. Lack of promotion um, pathways, lack of understanding and uh, leadership and direction in the newsroom. Um, and, and those are the, the top things that lead to the sort of dissatisfaction that um, makes it difficult to retain this talent, which we all believe is really important for the development and future of our news organizations. Um, so I think Nikki's typolo um, typology for these types of people was really helpful to, to me in trying to understand how to try to address this problem because it, there isn't a one-size-fits-all solution. Different types of news nerds will have different desires and different um, uh, interests that they want to pursue, and so there, there need to be different solutions for them. And there are also different um, periods in their careers um, that might have different um, requirements. So uh, I've tried to distill a lot of conversations here that have happened often in sort of very confidential settings, so no names, but I'll try to go through some of, some of that stuff. Um, starting with experience levels. Um, so at the entry level, I, I kind of, I kind of, I'm surprised by what Nikki said actually. I, I think in the last three or four years, um, uh, training for these skill sets has become very widely accessible at, at the university level. Um, I have no trouble finding entry level um, staff. Uh, I think there, there are plenty of people being trained with these skills. At, admittedly in a handful of institutions and a handful of courses, um, but there aren't all that many jobs for people with this skill set, contrary to the somewhat triumphalist um, rhetoric within the subculture that, oh, you know, we have these great skills that everybody wants. The reality is there aren't that many roles for people with specifically data skill sets in newsrooms. You know, it's, it's still very much a minority <coughs> pursuit. Um, so, Given the small number of roles, there's plenty of students learning this at high enough a level to, to um, regularly fill positions that come up at the entry level. Um, however, some, the, the existence of some of these new curricula is, um, is creating some expectations among students that, um, that there is a well-established path here and that there is um, a, a great demand and, and sort of valorization of their skill set within news organizations, which they then suddenly come to find doesn't really exist. They come into, into these roles and they realize very quickly that actually um, they're, a, they're, they're part of a, a small, tight-knit specialism that is, is a, it's a great community to be part of, but that is actually a tiny group within the wider context of journalism as a whole. Um, and that's often a bit of a shock to people who've been told um, as part of their education, that actually they have this great cutting edge skill set. Um, after a few years, suddenly they realize that actually they don't have the same established pathways available to them. Right? They're not necessarily going to go be correspondent somewhere overseas. They might be, um, but, uh, but that is um, that's not always in their interest because it might mean uh, atrophy of their skills. So they might have to become you know, heavily writing focused, going from the left end of Lisa's ch chart to the extreme right end and therefore losing all of their skills. 
um, the ones that made them so employable in the first place. So that's, that's sometimes, sometimes not seen as a good solution. Um, so some crave that security of a, a well-established role at that stage um, and get very anxious about the fact that those roles may not exist and that actually what's needed of them is to do what was discussed in the session earlier about bridge roles. It's really be pioneers and really just figure out what these, these functions will be in the future. And both of these can work. It's, it's kind of horses for courses and, and we can go into that in a minute. And then at the sort of senior level at, you know, basically my level, the people who are already running teams like this or have, you know, have, have some sort of a managerial experience, there is also sort of a, a ceiling there. Like what, what can you do next when you're, the, when you're a technical expert as opposed to a domain expert? When you haven't done that set of traditional journalism roles around the newsroom that are seen as prerequisites for higher level management or higher level um, editorial roles. Um, and there's an interesting thing that's emerging here that Nikki already alluded to, which is, the, which is people moving on into, into roles that blur the editorial or business side distinction, particularly in product management. I think that's a really interesting development of, of people with experiences in uh, data teams or, or similar, organ sort of similar roles um, moving into product development roles within news organizations, or indeed within organizations outside the news industry that are trying to do very similar things. <coughs> Um, so, at that middle level, this is where it's really most interesting, and I, I think this is where the typology into the three types of news nerds is useful, and I can just go through them really quickly. The hacker journalists, right, they are culturally closest to developers, right, so um, in some cases, as Nikki points out in her book, actually, uh, sometimes resist the very label of journalists, don't want to be seen as journalists, think of themselves much more as developers, um, and they have all the options of someone with that skill set. You know, there, there's a huge risk of them um, leaving the news industry to better paying and technically more challenging, frankly, roles elsewhere. So retaining them um, beyond idealism is a really tricky thing. Um, data journalists, other extreme, these are people who are probably closest to the traditional journalist role, and they might find the traditional pathway option very attractive, especially if they get to work in a space like public policy, where there's a huge amount of data available, and they can do sort of visually interesting journalism about tradition, you know, while, while in a traditional reporting kind of role. Um, we've done a lot of this at the FT. We have several people who've moved from our, our various data teams um, into traditional reporting roles, and that's, and that's a very useful way of seeding the newsroom with allies for this, this the, the sort of core group of people, because you suddenly have reporters who know how to do this work, who understand the technical constraints, um, who, are, who are really engaged in, in doing top-level work in this area. And then we get to the trickiest one, and this is the, the, the journalists who have learned a lot of programming, and who have, for whom, that technical skill set has become their real um, has been become their real selling point in, in terms of their career, and for this group, um, on the one hand, they, they face a sort of conundrum of wanting to be seen as more than just a developer, right? More than someone who, um, as Nikki described, doesn't really have the, the editorial understanding, to someone who actually owns their story. And, and does their own reporting. That, that's what they kind of want often, um, but they also fear doing what the data journalist might do and going on into a sort of traditional career path um, because of the risk to their skill set. And, that, and that for this group, this is where it gets really tricky and where I really don't have any good answers of, of how to square that circle, um, certainly outside of um, ever-growing responsibility within a specialist team. So that's, uh, the three different paths that I see. I think there's, there's, there's potential solutions in all of them, um, but also a lot of risks. And um, I'd, like to hear, I'd like to, love to hear if anyone has their own thoughts on this, and especially any solutions, because we're, we're very good on what the problem is um, and, and less, less clear on what the potential um, improvements are. Just coming back to the issue of status and um, yeah. quoting what Matt Dimsey Mm. wrote and then presented at NICAR, I believe. Um, he, he described 
he was wondering what value is seen by the editors for roles like this. He did, I think he mentioned the fight for bylines. Yeah. Is, is that something you've seen? And Nikki, having interviewed loads of people, would you, would you say our field is prestigious? Somebody mentioned prestige earlier. Um, so I, I'm very fortunate to work at a very data savvy newsroom <laughs> that has a large, that places a lot of emphasis on this and, and, and really values this. Um, and has for many years. You know, I'm the fourth editor of my team, and um, the graphics function, the statistics function, has been ex in existence for decades. So this, for 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 um, for my organization, this is less of a problem. But I certainly have heard that at smaller newsrooms, especially in the sort of context where a sole person, the entire newsroom is dependent on the skills of an in a single individual. That, that dependency breeds the sort of service mentality, the need to not sort of harness that person's skills for all manner of projects, um, makes them essentially a servant to, to the rest of the newsroom. And, uh, and I, I think that, that is a, you know, that, that sort of subservient position is not one that anybody wants to be. And autonomy, you know, having a lack of autonomy is, is a sort of classic recipe for dissatisfaction in a job. Yeah, um, so a couple of, of thoughts on this. Um, I think you have to think about, when you're talking about this kind of journalism as a whole, you need to think about scale and size. I think that's really important. The people sitting here have all worked at giant news organizations and are currently working at one of the premier uh, you know, sort of technological suites of, uh, for this. Um, so. I think when you talk about like moving up in a newsroom, that presumes there's more than one of you. Um, and so I think we all need to be a little bit more attuned. We're coming from like wealthy, you know, well-established news outlets, and that's who I studied, right? But if you're the if you're working in a regional newsroom, right, uh, or a local newsroom, this is going to be a lot harder, right? And the pathways to move up are essentially, as I've seen it over and over again, you get good, you win a prize, and then you go work at the New York Times or the Financial Times or the Guardian because it's exhausting to be one person who's being also asked, right, as newsrooms slim down, to fix the content management system, right, uh, to fix the web, you know, fix the home page, right? You can't, you can't be the sole technologist in a newsroom and be happy when you're asked to do just basic site maintenance, right, or content management. Um, maintenance. But the question is like, where are these journalists prestigious, right? What's what? And I think that that the subfield has been generally very good at tooting its own horn as being special. I do think that, you know, there are a lot of people in newsrooms who really want to work with programmer specialists, right? Because they know it's going to get their product, their project traffic, it's going to get their project prominence, it's going to get their project recognition in the newsroom. So to have your, your big story snowfalled, right, is like one of the best things that can happen. And given the timeline that, that you pointed out here, it doesn't, it, uh, snow falling a project doesn't take two hours, right? It's a months of planning to get something to be really high impact. But that gives the chance of um, programmers to really to really rise to the occasion. And so in the US, you see the teams that tend to have the most prestige plan around events that happen with regularity so they can show how good they are. Right, so for, for the states where we've got regularly occurring national elections, right, every two to four years, it becomes a big chance to show off, right? Olympics, another huge chance to show off, right? Um, and, and then like, various entertainments like the Oscars in, in the States are really big, right? So, so when people are paying attention, showing how good and important this is to the future of journalism ends off paying dividends. Um, and I think finally, I just wanted to push back on the idea of being a service desk. Um, so lots of things in a newsroom are service. Being an editor, as a service, right? Um, you serve the, the reporter, right? Um, but I also have, in my research, have found that, that, that uh, programming sort of programming journalists uh, teams that don't work directly with editorial end up finding their projects buried. So the question, like, and, and I think uh, Aaron Pilhoffer 
found this at both the Times and the Guardian, that you have to be a service desk generally to get your projects recognized um, because you need somebody to provide the content, right? And so I'm not sure it's always bad. What's bad is the, can you make this for me in two hours, right? And so, so it's rethinking, right? Should journalists know how to code? No, not all journalists should know how to code. Should all journalists know how to work with product teams, business staff, uh, technical specialists? Yeah, right? And maybe that means understanding what programming is, right? And so that's sort of my pushback a little bit. Um, but I would just be curious, Lisa, like <laughs> if you had been a, like an ambassador, right? Like who would you want to be when you grow up? Like, right, so, so like you obviously like want to lead something more than you are, right? Because you know you can. And it's a matter of getting people to like realize that these skill sets have groomed you for real sort of newsroom management. But like, what do you guys want to be when you grow up? Like, what is what does growing up look like to you? Not that you're not grown ups, but like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like you weren't advancing in the way you wanted to. What what did you want to be? You know? I, I think I didn't want to advance. Like I was. <laughs> this is I wanted to gain a lot of experience, so I always like switched newsrooms very quickly. Like yeah. I was my longest time at the newsroom was like for ten months. That was at NPR in Washington D.C. and that was like a fellowship, so it was yeah. clear that I was leaving. Um, but yeah, I think it was really valuable for me at this time, like in this entry level, to just switch newsrooms and to see how it um, works at different newsrooms. I wanted to go back to what you said about the service desk, though. Um, I think maybe you're right. Maybe the most crucial point is actually the respect that Matt Dempsey like, mentioned in his NICA talk um, a few months back. Um, and I, I think you mentioned, too. Um, I, think, I think that's actually something that also when journalists want to become journalist programmer, it's also like a lot in their way. I mean, like both the service and the respect. Maybe they gain respect with their, with their fellow journalists because then now they can code too. Um, but it will definitely be treated also as somebody who can do their work. Oh, you can code now, that's nice. You can do this craft for me, that's nice. Like, they're not gonna be so much journalists anymore. Um, I, I definitely seen that in a newsroom I've worked for, although not calling, not naming names. Yeah. Um, Nika, I just want to go. I just want to come back on what we were talking about entry level and and learning. And we were saying that now we've got we've got courses that prepare students really really well, even to the big newsrooms. And as someone who has one of his, uh, teaches one of his modules and has hired one of his former students, uh, you know, I, I, I would certainly agree with, um, with Martin. I think we're really good now at sort of narrowing down what we need to give the students in order for them to make a fantastic impression for job interviews and could be quite prepared for the job. But I think you disagree with that. You know, I wonder if it's like a, a, like a cultural context um, because uh, in the in the states, we have like there are accredited and unaccredited journalism schools. This isn't a bad thing. If you're an unaccredited journalism school, it just means you get more say over what classes you get to have your students take. But um, as part of our journalism curriculum, you've got to remember, like students, and some of you guys are students yourself. There's a big barrier to just like knowing and identifying what a news story is, right? That takes like. For some people who are really bright and who are the ones I'm imagining you guys are hiring, like especially at like sort of mid-tier schools like the one I'm at, right? I'm in a top research university, but I'm in like, you know, the top 50 school in the United States. Still a very good school. But like my students aren't coming in being like, I know what a lead is. I know what a good question for a story is. I know what a sizable story looks like. Um, we actually have to teach them very basic things we have to like get them over picking up the phone to call somebody, much less like emailing and asking for a data set. Like that would take me like, that take like I don't teach like actual skill sets. Like I just teach like thinking about journalism. But like getting a student to email the World Bank to ask for a data set in a like CSV form versus the PDF that they presented it is like like 
that takes like two years of being in a journalism school, right? So I, I just think it might be just like a, a cultural context thing, but you've got to remember how much you need to learn in your, your four years of school to get to the expertise that you guys are talking about. So I think you just maybe are really lucky at getting these brilliant people. I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about people at master's level, so I, I don't know of anyone yeah. at undergraduate level who's doing this really successfully. Um, uh, and actually, I think that this problem, this trade-off between the various skills you have to learn follows into career development in once you're in work. Because there is, you know, like it or not, um, there is a trade-off between maintaining technical mastery and gaining, gaining the sort of domain um, expertise that a sort of top-tier beat reporter has. You cannot be a expert in you know, say R or D3, and maintain that level of mastery while also covering a beat to the level of a Financial Times correspondent. Just not possible, right? And so there is inevitably a trade-off um, between which end of the spectrum you want to be on. So if you decide you're gonna be a reporter, there is this, this risk that you're gonna have to p pull back on some of the technical skills that have got you to where you are. And, and that, to a lot of people, is very, very scary. And, and trying to overcome that um, is, is very difficult. And, and actually, one of the things that I, I haven't shown, but, but I was thinking about, um, is that I, one of the things I think, in, in that sort of rush to valorize data journalism as a new thing, um, I think we have sometimes, we need to pull back and have a bit of respect for the traditional skills of journalism, right? And remember that, um, uh, there is, there, is, there is sometimes a bit of a perception of arrogance in our organizations about, about news, about data journalists. So that actually, um, there are very complicated skills to be learned to be a top tier reporter, right? You need to learn how to write for a start. You need to have all those interviewing skills and some of those sort of, um, sort of touchy-feely people skills, right? Like, th these are not things that come automatically, right? So there are, um, those are things that reporters get really good at through lots of practice that you don't get when you're making graphics all day. So can I tell you what really scares me, though? Um, uh, what really scares me is like the assumption that like you come out of school knowing how to visualize data and knowing how to like clean the data to make it into something interactive and programmy, but you don't actually know how to ask questions of the data, right? And so I'm a social scientist, right? Like, I understand how to ask questions of data. That is like what, you know, my PhD gives me the ability to look at empirical research and either find the problems with it or understand the questions to ask, right, or that haven't been asked or how that data got to be. And so, you know, I think the failures in U.S. election reporting I think really showcase some of the problems and vulnerabilities when you've got a bunch of data journalists who are like, I've got this data, I'm going to visualize it, it's data, it's certain, right? And, and that is deeply problematic, right? So it's more, if you're going to have the specialty of being able to work with data, there's more to just the skills, it's the, it's the science, right? And so, I mean, I think that was Phil Meyer's original vision in precision journalism was giving journalism more respect through applying social science methods, right? And that ultimately, I think, has to be part of the core of if you're talking about distinguishing yourself. Right? At a time when journalism is facing all sorts of challenges to its authority, one of the best things that can happen in a newsroom is to produce good, solid, fact-based, empirically driven journalism, which you can have when you have data, right? That is a credible, well-understood data. But when you do it poorly, the vulnerabilities are even worse, right? It is really easy for Donald Trump to say, fake news, all those polls were wrong, right? When they were as wrong as they usually are, right? Um, but presented in such, I mean, I can't make the connection between Donald Trump calling it fake polls and like bad data journalism, but I think there's, a, <laughs> I think there is a link there is all I'm trying to say. And that's the level, that's the stakes we're playing at, right? Um, and, and I think it's, it's, it's just, it's critically important. And so I, I don't know what that means, but. 
disagree, right? You know, I just, I don't, I don't know. Uh, um, maybe to come back to the topic of the panel, um, <laughs> I would like for Basil actually to answer Nikki's question, like what do you want to do when you grow up? Where do you want to advance? Uh, I would like to be an astronaut, actually. Yeah. An astronaut? Oh, yeah, yeah, go to space and see things. No, I mean, um, the, the reason why I started talking to, to Martin and to, to all of you is because I'm, I'm asking myself the questions and we haven't touched on other alternatives. We talked about some um, uh, public service and um, sort of government-led initiatives. We've got some great stuff in the, um, in the UK. They are obviously, we talked over lunch about the tech giants, uh, these extraordinary companies like Data Wrapper, some flowers for you. Uh, and then fas fascinating journalists oriented group like the ICIJ, OCCRP, who do extremely valuable work, um, or create your own thing. Uh, I participated in an effort to monitor strikes in, in Iraq and Syria, and that was extremely um, personally fulfilling. And there's also the roles around audience development. We mentioned product right. and all this stuff. If you want to go towards the engineering developer, developer route, and one big question we haven't talked about yet, and I think we should get the audience in on this one, but yeah. there's a, we talked about a cult of journalism, and I wonder how long can you last before you say yes to the big money and start <laughs> going completely out of the field? I think um, Elijah Meeks talked about, talked about this topic, you know, people living, if data visualization is so hot, why are people leaving the field and going, to, going, going off to something else? So should we turn it over to you guys? Lots of questions, please. Do we have microphones, yeah? yeah? Do you want to back to the slide? No, no, no. Is it on? Yeah, I think the... Hello. Um, I, I guess maybe this is more in, orientated towards Martin, just, uh, or, or Bazile as well, in terms of um, newsroom situations. I just, uh, do you have a bit more information about, or something to say about sort of... Um, coming up with these new roles um, in terms of progression, how you might have gone about pitching it to um, the hierarchy, um, various successes and difficulties that you've come along the way? Um, I, I, I think uh, if, you, if you Google uh, Financial Times creative producers, yeah, I think that, that might be the best example that we have for our attempt to create a career pathway for people with this sort of skill set, right? Um, so Robin Kwong, a former colleague of mine on my team, um, is now uh, running a new team that we've just finished recruiting for that is going to be a set of sort of commissioning editors for special projects or, or for, for particular like visually led stories um, who are gonna be based on each of the desks of the team. And now this is a more senior role that people with um, specialist digital skill sets can aspire to, right? So um, we, it does happen that these jobs get created just because they don't exist today doesn't mean they won't exist in two years' time. So um, the, the, some of the sort of anxiety about career paths may be misplaced because, because news organizations evolve and they create functions um, as, as particular skill sets come to be institutionalized and um, need to be done more systematically than in, you know, in the sort of quite um, one-off way that, that they often start out in. That answer the question. And um, on, on our side, obviously you're familiar with all the new roles we've got with the, with the audience team. Some people are, are moving, um, talking about the, the developer side of Lisa's charts. Some people have moved to doing tooling and some yeah. advanced engineering full time while, while remaining on editorial contract and working for, um, working for a newsroom. We've made some people senior. And as to answer your question, I am literally pitching something for us at the moment, exactly about this, trying to make something up. And what I've been told is you need, you need a bit of a vision. And um, I think the success of that endeavor will depend on how supportive the bosses are of you know, evolving staff that's a couple of years in into something a bit more senior. Well, one other thing uh, that we do for the hacker journalist group, um, our hacker journalists are not actually on editorial contracts. They are seconded to us from technology, which means that they, are, um, they have the option of going either way because they are within um, 
they're also rotating around some of the teams in the wider technology group of the FT. Um, so that gives them a whole other range of options beyond editorial. Now, not everybody, like most people who specifically joined a data journalism type team aren't necessarily interested in that. But in at least one case, this has you know, led to someone being promoted into one of the senior engineering roles at the FT out of, out of our team. So um, that can work, like setting up structures specifically to facilitate movement um, in, in non-traditional paths as well. Um, hi, this is kind of what I've been selling to people in other countries, so tell me if this is completely wrong. Um, so what I've been telling them is, it's okay, media houses are hiring bridge roles, so already you're getting closer to like the rest of the newsroom, they're starting to understand your roles better, like the, the gap is, is getting narrower. Second, we're growing data literacy among entry-level journalists, so we're kind of sort of raising the overall like level of nerdiness of the newsroom and then step three we're just going to wait for all the old editors to retire <laughs> or die no, no we're not we're gonna we're gonna bring them along <laughs> so this not. is like the long this is like the long game like is that at all like re so like yeah step one fine good bridge rolls are nice S everyone gets nerdier and we just wait for the old guard to phase out and everything to get more digital is that like not gonna work so i mean i think that's why we're so lucky right now that there's been an explosion of the voxes and the quartzes and the like digital first uh sites because they show that like there is a totally alternative model for thinking about data and news. And so I hope that those organizations will continue to be successful because they don't have to think twice about what a bridge role is. If you told somebody in product advice that they were working at a bridge role, they'd be like, uh, what's that? Right, and so, so like, what I think that these sort of digital first companies are teaching everybody else is that there's not editorial that's the the king, right? It's or queen, right? It's it's that all of these things, audience, product, corporate, business, comms, are all important and integral, and you can't have one without the other. And so, I think. As the, you know, the innovation report, right, that Martin brought up, the New York Times is salivating over companies that don't even exist anymore. Seriously, like Circa, right? They're like, we, we need to be on the ball to be like Circa, right? <laughs> and so, so I think that, that what you're saying um, points to some of the problems, but I also think the solutions are already visible and can be pointed at. So maybe that's another way of, of talking about it. Yes, I mean, I would agree with the first two, but I, you know, I'd strongly disagree with the third. Um, I think, I think uh, companies like Vox, like Quartz, companies like, that, are, that have no legacy have the luxury of hiring in a specific image. Those of us who have, um, you know, a legacy product and a, and a workflow debt that comes with that um, have to bring along that team. We can't just sack everybody and start again. Like that, that's not, that's not a, a way to run a business and, and sort of retrain the, retain the trust of, of employees, right? So a, a, an approach that, that also teaches new skills to existing members of staff is, is, is absolutely crucial. And, and then that's a big part of what we've been doing with our visual vocabulary program. It's all about um, shifting our workflows away from old print-centric production processes into web-based, um, you know, basically making static graphics through interactive technologies, right? Like that's what we do now for everything. Everything starts on the web in a browser written in code, even if it's going on a printed page, right? And so suddenly a whole team of people who work in graphics and have for decades in some cases um, are now, you know, building everything they do routinely in D3. Uh, you know, if you told me that three years ago, I'd have laughed at you. It's completely impossible. But it, that's what we do now. I I mean, absolutely. The, uh, I think the first issue you, you brought up about the bridge roles is that if you wait for these roles to be created, it sort of forces you to jump ship every year or so, and sometimes you might just want to stay for an, with an employer for an extended period of time. Um, as for waiting for the long game, it seems like an, it strikes me as an, a not, not one I would want to consider myself. I, I wouldn't want to make a career out of being frustrated and waiting for some people to just go away. So. To completely echo what Martin was saying, for us at the Times, it's been training, 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 and 
echoing again what you said, the, uh, one of the surprising things, uh, particularly with our um, print graphics um, workflow, is that you find some people find a new found interest in their job and the new techniques and renewed creativity because you sort of free up a bit of, a bit of space and a bit of time. And so that's working very well for us. Yeah, I think I would like to add another dimension to the whole discussion. I would argue that the role of interactive or data journalists will change when it's not dependent on a pat of the uh, of a back from, from the senior editorial journalist, but from the audience. Um, that's why I'm looking a little bit away from the traditional formats, like what we all try to do, but all do the same, into new formats, like examples, um, uh, New York Times food section. It's well done. It's a good service. It might not be traditional journalism, but it, it has value. Right. Then um, uh, our world in data, um, which is, you could argue it's from a university, but we, we love looking at it. But it provides perspective. And what the data journalists have not done so far is creating real value, like either audiences or even revenues. Um, and once you create revenue in these changing organizations, I would argue that you move from the fringes more into the center. So I'm going to push back on that because I've seen some of the revenue. <laughs> um, that, like, If you think about revenue in terms of traffic optimization and bringing new people to the site, there's nothing better than a good interactive. Um, the stuff like So I think I looked up Nate, so the traffic to 538 um, over the last election, and I think it grew by like 200x. Um, and uh, even if you go back to some old projects like Snowfall, one out of every three visitors to the New York Times had never been to the New York Times before. And one of the advantages of doing interactives around specialized topics is that it brings new people in. And so if you're a really smart news organization like the Times has been, um, uh, you can say, well, this story brings in, like the jockey is a good example of this, like this story brings in people who care about horses, who don't usually come to the Times, but we know when they're here, we're going to optimize that they see X number of stories populate in their, you know, in their suggested stories list, right? So. I, I just think like the traffic incentive has reduced a lot of shitty, excuse my language, data journalism because it is shareable, clickable, profitable, engages the audience. I mean, I just, I don't know. I mean, you've probably I mean, seen, you've probably seen the, the numbers too. Yeah, I mean, I've seen our numbers and um, I mean, I can't, I can't divulge specifics, but you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be committing the resources that we do to this if it didn't do something to our overall strategy in terms of increasing um, the audience and retaining the existing audience, which is really crucial to, to our strategy. Yeah, it's, it's the same thing for us. I want to drag down Beta back into the conversation before he leaves. Ha. We literally... Our, our oh, team, he's running away. Our team literally <laughs> build our reputation and the trust we've got from the editors on the fact that the, the big experiences and uh, websites and projects like this we create are successful and bring people to the site. Many of them register, some of them subscribe, and oh. this, yeah, this is a small, a small proportion, but uh, yeah, success where, success where it is. And to um, make another point from your, from your question, um, on new sections and new formats like this, you also need to sort of um, pimp up your, your CMS on your website in order to be able to measure success and which metrics you use and how do you find new people, find new audiences, and then you sort of need specialized people to do that. And then again, we're talking audience development, uh, new formats, and sometimes product, the new section of the New York Times couldn't have done it, uh, like they, when they got wire in. It's a new part of their website in their CMS, I, I believe, and so you need folks to do that as well. Um, uh, in addition to the question uh, of you, um, um, in the beginning of the session you uh, sketched like the, this division between the, the data vis uh, team and the journalists, like a like, uh, divided world. Um, um, and we can say uh, there should be bridges 
uh, who bridge this gap and, and take this role or not. Um, um, but the umbrella term was like interactive journalism. So my question is, um, uh, what does this discussion mean for the interactivity uh, within the newsroom? So what kind of conversations sh should there be? What kind of teamwork? Because journalists are sometimes really individual workers and they just outsource their data job to the data fist team. So what kind of dialogue should there be in the newsroom? to bridge this gap. It's like, what, what went wrong? Like, <laughs> what's happening to you? The dialogue did shut up. Yeah, this is a good question. Well, yeah, I'm just complaining. I don't um, have so much a solution. Um, I think there definitely should be tools. There definitely should be a skill set or knowledge how to make these simple charts that are needed in like so many articles. Um, and that's why I'm working for a company that builds exactly that charting tool for, for journalists because I believe in the fact that uh, journalists should build simple charts themselves and then um, there will be time for the, these database um, people, for like these app developers, et cetera, um, to work on the big hard stuff they actually want to do um, and in which they're really good in. So I think most of the database people they actually want to build um, these three, four weeks projects. Um, I think it's it's nice to have like a, um, a change sometimes. Like I really liked um, the work in these teams because I had like two hour projects and I also had like two week projects and I had two month projects. Um, but I think there shouldn't be too many two hour projects that could also be done by journalists. So the dialogue should be Database people should teach journalists how to build these simple charts, and journalists and database people should have a really good collaboration about um, how to make these really big, nice things. You know what I'm thinking about? I'm thinking about how when you order a photograph, right, um, you don't even, like, talk to the person, right? Like, when you, when you like, ask for, a, like, if you want a definition of, like, a service position, these poor photographers, you put it in, like, a form, and then you press send, and it goes to a photo editor who then dispatches it to a photographer. So, like, that, like, it could be significantly worse, right? So just, like, for perspective. Um, so, but, I, I mean, when I've seen it work well, like in sort of cross cross organization is actually very prize driven now that I think about it, right? So the New York Times has a has a, a basically a Pulitzer editor. That's not what they're called, but it's like a special projects editor. And so that special project editor will identify like 30 of the paper's best stories for the year. And he will make sure, she will make sure these people are going to be meeting regularly to talk about the interactive components to talk about the multimedia components because you can't win a Pulitzer anymore without all of this stuff. Um, and, and so, but then there's the other sort of more organic thing where somebody who is, who can make their own chart but knows that they need more than a chart will, will do this individually and like approach somebody and say like, I've got this cool story, it's gonna drop at this point like help me set up, like you might not know how to do this, is there somebody on your team who can do this? Let's, let's work together. Um, but it could be worse, so just remember that. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it could be worse and it was worse, including at, at my place. So um, the, 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 the key is to shift people away from that ordering up a photograph mentality of, of a chart is the last thing that happens as part of the process to a workflow in which data analysis is integral to the reporting of the story rather than merely the, the, the final presentation layer of the story. And that's a real shift in mindset for a lot of people and that's, that's a slow education process that has to be done gradually with a lot of patience. Um, and I, I would say that like, once uh, that is in place and you see it's successful, if a story kind of, we say, can you start with the chart? and encapsulate the story, the core elements of the story, the who, what, when, with uh, a visualization, which because it's a nice encapsulation, is easily shareable on social media, it's a, an instant sort of branding exercise for the story, which, and it also frees up copy for the writer to concentrate on the analytical part, the why and the how of the story that you can't necessarily visualize, right? So that's, the, once reporters 
get that, once they sort of grok that, that way of thinking about graphics, um, suddenly data gets used in a much more sophisticated way, in a much more integral way, rather than as a, as a sort of uh, 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 an art layer, right, over the top. The, the, the annoying thing about doing a panel with you is that I agree with what you say ever so much. <laughs> but to, to come back to what you're saying, I think outsourcing is the, is the absolute nightmare. This service desk mentality, we touched on it earlier, it's true for photographers, it's true for many graphics uh, teams, particularly when they work for newspapers, and I'm not even talking about broadcast. Yeah. Um, okay. The dream is collaboration or integrated team. M my team, the interactive team at the, the Times and the Sunday Times, we now sit with the desks. I sit with a foreign desk and we go at conference twice a day, you're working with the stories and every once in a while you're gonna be working for the next edition of the paper that goes the next day, that's a short deadline. Every once in a while you, you just hear, oh, uh, we're sending our Middle East correspondent to Iraq because, oh, we had forgotten that actually there's an election in 20 days. Suddenly, I've got my working orders and I can go back to my editor and then to the, to the section heads and be like, okay, we could do something really nice out of this deployment. And I've got the time to sort of invest and come back and pitch and get a designer in and get, yeah, all the, all the resources you need. And so wh whether you do collaboration between newsrooms or when we all pull together to do Olympics, there's the World Cup coming, then there's an election, the sort of the dream of news nerds, big election so you can compare uh, what your team is doing, <coughs> or, so collaboration or integration with the, with the other teams, I think this is part of the solution for better, well, for more respect, really. All right, I think. 1901, time 1901. to go. Thank you ever so much for coming.